After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he, took out his, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So good to have you. You guys ready to get into God's word? I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I am. I'm excited. I'm <laughs> yeah, a few of you. I am really excited. God is doing some incredible things, and I am so excited for the future of this church and what God wants to do. And I just want to say that God is good, and he is doing incredible things. He's worthy of our praise, and I'm excited to get into the, to Acts chapter 18. It's amazing that that God keeps using Acts to not only minister to your pastor through navigating different changes, but just, just how he's, he's applying what we're learning in the book of Acts to our life today. It's just incredible. God is just good. Can I say that? He's, he's so good. Few of you think so. God is good, all right? If you're new here, we love the Bible. We love it so much. We preach expository uh, preaching every week. That means we go through books of the Bible. We go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, line by line, precept upon precept, because we believe that you have come here to hear God's word, not my opinion, uh, not what I want to impose on a text, but the best way that we're going to be ministered to is God speaking to us, and the way he does that is through his word. Uh, you heard Jonah say it before, but the word of God does the work of God by the spirit of God and the lives of the people of God. And that's what we believe here at New Heights. And so that's what we're going to do. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, like I said, we're in Acts chapter 18. I was going to do 24 verses today, but then I was reminded we had a baby dedication. And as much as you guys love me and love God's word, you probably don't want to be here for two hours well, uh, I, I go through scripture. So uh, we're looking at verses 1 through 11 today, and we'll pick up next week in verse 12. But have you ever heard the story about two young fellas uh, and their snow shoveling business? They were carrying a, a snow shovel and a bag of dollar bills, and they saw a man shoveling his own driveway that was covered in snow. So being the little entrepreneurs they were, they approached him and offered to remove his snow for just two Dollars. Now that's a great deal, isn't it? But the man said, now why in the world would I do that? Can't you see I'm, I'm shoveling my own driveway? I'm doing it myself. They said, well, yeah, sir, uh, we can see that, but that's exactly how we made all this money today, from people who started but couldn't finish. <laughs> no such thing as quitting when it comes to following Jesus. No such thing as quitting when it comes to following Jesus. Anytime I hear the word, don't quit, my, my mind immediately goes back to my childhood. I was a wrestler, and if you're, if, if you're new to New Heights, you won't know this, but if you're, you've been attending for a while, you've heard me share all the stories. I didn't go into wrestling originally because I understood what it was. I went into wrestling because I thought it was the stuff you see on TV, and so I had my grandma make me a really cool robe with sparkles and stuff, and I, I don't remember what my name was, he, Justin the Hebrew Hammer, I don't. I don't know what I called myself, but 
I thought I was going to be going into that kind of wrestling only to figure out that this was a whole other kind of wrestling. But anytime I hear the words don't quit, I go back to my dad, who was also my coach, on the sideline just screaming, don't quit. Because the first thing I'd want to do if he got me down is I would want to quit. You know, I told you I joined it because I thought it was, I was going to be a showman. I definitely did not join it because I thought I'd be grappling with some dude in a singlet. And so the sooner I got pinned, the better. But my dad would be yelling, don't quit. Now, I, I did get to a point where I loved wrestling and would, would go on to wrestle. And I, I was okay at wrestling. I'm just going to throw that out there. I wasn't too bad. It was a long time ago. But I, I, always hear, I always think back to my dad, don't quit, don't quit. In fact, when I took this job, our founding pastor, Pastor Hugh Rosenberg, gave me some of the best advice I've ever heard. He said, Pastor Justin, I want to tell you something. You only lose when you refuse to get up. That's when you lose. In other words, don't quit. He said, don't quit. Go into it with that mentality. You are not going to quit. Your critics, uh, those that want to hurt you, you only lose when you don't get up. If you keep getting up, you don't lose. Get up, day after day, get up, get up, get up. There's no quitting in Christianity, get up. There's no quitting when God's called you to something, get up. It was the best advice I've ever gotten, and Pastor Hugh knew a few things about not quitting and not giving up, right? If you knew him, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I know that God's called us to live the abundant life, that doesn't mean we don't go through seasons of challenges and hardship. I mean, for goodness sakes alive, if we don't see that at this point in the book of Acts, we're just spiritually blind. It isn't like this is something new either in the book of Acts. I mean, even Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, and you have heard it the last four weeks, in this world you will have tribulation. Man, that's a bold statement for Jesus to make to his disciples. And then he goes on to say this, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. How has he done that? I'll tell you how he's done that. Through his death and resurrection, he conquered the world. And that means he's defeated the power and the strategies of the enemy. Sickness, poverty, fear, the list can go on. Jesus also gave us this promise that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Look at Romans chapter eight. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is a law of gravity which pretty much says what goes up must come down. This law applies to everybody. <laughs> When we have the law, and then we've got the law of aerodynamics, which says what goes up can remain there. And here's an example. When a plane is flying, it's operating by the law of aerodynamics. The law of gravity still exists, but the plane is operating in a greater law that conquers the law of gravity, right? You following me? All right, look at what Romans 8, 2 says. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross, and now we can live by the law of the Spirit that is filled with God's promises for our lives. Okay? So now that doesn't mean we don't face challenges. Like I said, we are going to face challenges in life, but it does mean Jesus is always greater than all of them. I did just say that. Jesus is greater than all of your problems. Jesus is greater than all of your problems. No matter where you find yourself today, no matter what you're facing, Jesus is greater than all of your problems. That's powerful. We've been in Acts this last year. We've, we've had a front row seat into the life and the ministry of Paul, and, and boy, did he face some major challenges. But one thing Paul did not do in the midst of the storm, in the middle of him getting beat down, <laughs> when his friends abandoned him, when he experienced pain emotionally and physically, the one thing he didn't do was quit or be defeated. I love the quote Dr. V. Raymond Edmond, who used to teach at Wheaton College, used to tell his students, it's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. Quitting is not an option. Paul chose to focus on the eternal word of God for his life rather than the challenges that he faced. No matter how hard, no matter how tough it got, quitting was not an option. 
Listen to me, church, we can do the same today. So much to learn from Paul's life. All right, we're gonna, we get discouraged in life. That's gonna happen, things happen. I think that roof is leaking and that terrifies me. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm gonna move this just a little bit before this window comes crashing down, amen? Quitting, <laughs> but I ain't gonna quit my sermon, I'll tell you that. That window, that, that stained glass can come crashing down, I'm gonna keep preaching, amen? Because <laughs> quitting's not an option. We get discouraged in life, things happen, but I want you to understand, it, the text that we're looking at today, Paul was discouraged. He was discouraged. However, in these verses, we're gonna see how Paul approached discouragement. And it's gonna be really beneficial to us in our own life especially when we find ourselves in that season where it's very difficult. In fact, the account of Paul in Corinth is, is a record of not only how the Holy Spirit ministered through Paul, but how, how it's an encouraging description of how the Holy Spirit ministered to Paul. When do you guys know, yes, God wants to minister through you, but he also wants to minister to you, right? All right, today we've got the opportunity to learn a few things that were true in the life of Paul and in the church, and today you and I can apply them to our life. Before we do that, I wanna just pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we ask you to please open our eyes to the truth of your word. I pray for wisdom as I prepare to read your word, and clarity for while I read, and discernment as I apply your word to the hearts of all those who are here this morning. God, let your word change our actions. I pray the truth that we study today will transform our hearts and our minds to follow more after you, and I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, before we jump in, we, we need to know that Paul walked about 50 miles from Athens, and this must have been a walk where he had a lot of time to think about things, uh, think about some of the discouraging things that he had just been through, uh, probably was thinking about the lack of response that he just experienced in Athens. And, and I say all of this because we get this insight from, from, the, Paul, from Paul, the Paul, well, he is the Paul. We get this insight from Paul in the letter he wrote to the church in Corinth much later, and I wanna look at that before we jump in. You kinda get an idea of where Paul is at when he's walking into the city of Corinth. He says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and in him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul is being raw right here. I don't know about you, but I, I find really incredible encouragement to know that the great apostle Paul battled discouragement. So here's what I'll say. Don't be discouraged in thinking that you're alone in discouragement. <laughs> don't think I'm the only one that gets discouraged. In fact, some Bible scholars actually believe that Paul was depressed here not just discouraged, but that he was depressed. Most scholars will say at this point in Paul's ministry career, he was considering giving up. He was discouraged and wanted to throw in the towel. If Paul, the great man of God, who was just always going strong and always confident in the Lord, I mean, he's the guy who literally wrote, all things work together for the good of those who love Jesus. That's Paul to those who are called according to his purpose. Paul, he's the one who wrote this. He's the guy who said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, if this guy could get to a place in his life where he was actually discouraged or despondent and, and maybe even disheartened and wanted to quit, well then we're probably capable of being in that same place as well, right? And if God could help Paul, then surely God can help us, right? He can help me when I'm discouraged. God can encourage my heart. God can help me to keep going, to keep trucking, keep moving on. God can encourage me to do what Pastor Hugh said, don't quit, get up, don't quit. Never quit, keep getting up, right? Man, at this point, Paul had been whipped, beaten, falsely accused, thrown into a dungeon in Philippi. And I know, I know, the Lord sent an earthquake and opened the prison, and the jailers were converted. But, but that's a pretty difficult thing to go through. 
after being stoned in Lystra, being, being run out of town in Derby, and just facing opposition everywhere he went. Every corner he turned, there was opposition. He's facing all of this persecution. And like I said, it's believed at this point that not only was he battling depression, but there are some historians and scholars who believe that Paul was battling physical sickness. So if it's not bad enough that you're, you're discouraged and you're depressed, you're, you're in both emotional and physical pain, and now you're battling a physical illness. And that's why Paul could say, wow, that's why Paul could say, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Isn't that what discouragement does? It beats you down to you just giving in to fear. Have you ever been there or is it just me? Weakness, fear, trembling. Man, I've been there. Paul's getting raw, and I've been there before. However, God knows exactly where Paul's at. He knows, he knows what he needs emotionally, and he knows what Paul needs to encourage him, and he knows what Paul's gonna need so that Paul could keep going on, so that Paul could continue to do what God has called him to do, and that's what we get a look at today. So the first thing I wanna show you is in, in verses one through five, and here it is. It's not something new. We've been talking about it all throughout the book of Acts. When you're battling discouragement, you need community. You need spiritual community. I wanna talk about this. Look with me. Verse one, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, now, I gotta stop, because I need to tell you a little bit about Corinth, okay? But first, it's just amazing to me, because Paul is like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going and going and going. He doesn't quit. He's left Athens, he finds himself in the city of Corinth, he's alone, and the going was tough, but Paul doesn't give up. Corinth, what an what a interesting city Corinth was had a population of 200,000 people, and it would not really be an easy place to start a church. In fact, if I lived during the time of Paul and God was like, Justin, go start a, a church in Corinth, I would probably say, no, thank you. <laughs> not an easy place to start a church, and, and this is where God has led Paul to. And let me tell you something. Choosing to obey God may not always be easy, but what comes from your obedience is worth the struggle. And that's, that's not an easy pill to swallow. Choosing to obey God may not always be easy, but what comes from your obedience is worth the struggle. It's worth the struggle. Trust in his plan, and you can be guaranteed that God will use your life for eternal purposes. Choose, choose to obey God, but know that it might not be easy. Corinth is about 50 miles west of Athens, and when Paul visited this city, it was the capital of the Roman province of Greece. It was a center of commerce and trade, and it was located on a narrow neck of land between the Adriatic Sea and the Aegean Sea. I think I have a map here, just to kind of give you an idea of where it's at. Here's you kind of see Paul's second missionary journey that he's been on, and now he's gone from Athens to Corinth. Um, the Greeks had built a skidway across the narrow isthmus over which they actually dragged small ships on Greece skids. I've actually been there, and I've actually seen that. I should have showed a picture of that, but I gave Corey different pictures, so hold on just one minute. But uh, in, in Corinth was one of the most beautiful places I have ever been. It, it was magnificent. It was just a beautiful, natural setting, and uh, the food was pretty good too. <laughs> but this is gonna kind of serve as a, as a promo for the trip that we're about to do coming up in a year, I believe, and uh, we're gonna be doing another trip, and it's called the Footsteps of Paul, and so you get to travel to some of these places. This is me in the city of, of Corinth, and you would get to see places just like this. It's just what an incredible opportunity for you. If you haven't signed up, get on there and, and sign up. And don't let money scare you. God is good. He provides. And I've had lots of people sign up for trips like this, never knowing how they're going to get a go. And God always does amazing things and stretches and grows their faith. So if that's something that interests you, sign up. But Corinth was the center of worship for Aphrodite, the goddess of sex. 
There was a, a great temple of Aphrodite on the Acro Corinth, um, and that was the picture that you just saw where you could see the hill behind me, the hill in the back of the city from which every evening a thousand priestess of the temple would come down into the city streets to ply their trade, indulging in the worship of sex. And so Corinth had gained a reputation through all of the Roman world as the center of sensuality. Now are you kind of understanding why if God had called me to plant a church in Corinth, I would have been like, no, thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was a very difficult place to go as a missionary, and yet that's where God had called Paul. In fact, whenever a citizen of Corinth was portrayed in a drama, it was always not a good thing. He was portrayed as somebody who had absolutely no morals and usually portrayed as a drunk. This is where Paul has gone. This is where Paul finds himself, and it's crazy to me to think that in the midst of Paul's discouragement, he's battling depression, that the Lord sends him to Corinth. Man, couldn't he just go to an easier place? But no, God has him go to Corinth. And let's pick up the story from there. Verse two, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. So once again, we've got this reoccurring theme in the life of Paul, and that's this. The Christian life is not a solo act. You can't do it alone. We see a relationship that's being formed here. It's a relationship with Aquila and Priscilla, and this relationship is gonna be mentioned over and over throughout Paul's writing. In fact, in Romans chapter 16, I don't think I've got this one, but I'll make sure. In Romans chapter 16, no. It says this, I commend to you, to you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centuria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. And then verse three says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. So they're mentioned in the book of Romans. And they're mentioned in the letter to, in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. And in 2 Timothy 4, 19, Paul says, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. So they're mentioned, and they're mentioned in a good way. I just got to listen to uh, Alistair Begg preach uh, out of, Second Timothy, and I love what he said because he said, Paul mentions a lot of people. There's kind of two lists. There's the good mention list and the not so good. But they're on the good mention list. He mentions them in a good way because there's a friendship. There's a relationship. There was spiritual community there. Do you see that? Now, Aquila was a leather worker, which happened to be what Paul did also because every Jewish boy was taught a trade as it regarded uh, to work with his hands, and Paul was taught the craft of repairing tents. And Pr Priscilla and Aquila, who were husband and wife, had recently been forced to leave their homes in Rome because of anti-Semitism. They were forced to leave because Claudius, the Roman emperor, commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And so here they are, both of them probably in desperate need for community. This wasn't a good departure of Rome for them. And Paul's discouraged, and what do you know? Bam, the Lord crosses their paths. They end up becoming uh, friends. They end up opening their home to Paul and even partnered with him in business. And when Paul uh, eventually leaves and he goes to Ephesus, they go with him. <laughs> and they were still in Ephesus when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And they were even hosting the church inside of their home. They eventually end up getting to go back to Rome, but because of uh, crossing paths with Paul in Corinth, there's this beautiful and amazing friendship that came to be. Isn't God good how he brings people into our lives? You know, I, I always struggle with people who tell me they don't need to go to church. I love Jesus, but I don't need church. Because that's really selfish. That's really selfish, because here's the truth, somebody needs you. That's how, that's how God works, that's how community is. I love God, but I don't love his church. <laughs> I don't get it. 
love God, but I don't love his church. God, God wants to use you, and you, you actually need people more than you realize. You might say, I don't need the church, but you do. You do need the church. And here's the truth, there are people in the church who need you. And that's what God is doing, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's directing their steps and he's bringing them together because there's this gonna be this beautiful relationship that comes from this. And then, Silas and Timothy arrive. Well, Paul knows them, They're quite, they, they get the, quite the welcome from Paul. And they bring two things with them, good news about the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica and they bring an offering. <laughs> This offering allows Paul to be free so he can commit himself to the teaching of God's word. And, and God knew that what Paul needed, what Paul needed was friends, friends that gave a chance to kind of to rebuild his energies, kind of a, an opportunity for him to recover. And I hope you see, I hope you see what community is here. Okay? Today, you might be the one needing to recover. Or you may, you may be the one helping others to recover. But you are needed here. You understand, you are needed here. It's not by accident that you attend New Heights Church. All right? I don't want you to miss it. Friends came into Paul's life at the right time, and God used them to encourage Paul so he could continue to do the work that God had called him to do. Paul, in his letters to the Corinthians, referred to the church as the body of Christ. Our physical bodies, they need, they need different organs and parts to survive. Each part has a role and, and can't fully function in its role without the other parts of the body, right? I was just teaching this to my, my 12-year-old son, Asher. The body of Christ is like our physical bodies. What would somebody do if they were born with just eight arms? He laughed. Well, yeah, it's funny to think about. But, but he got it, right? What would somebody do if they were born with uh, four eyes but no mouth? Well, they couldn't eat. Yeah, that's right, Asher. You see, you see how the body of Christ works? We need each other. We need each other. Each part has a role. We can't function without, without all the roles. It's the same with the relationship between Christians. Though we may be different from one another, we're equally needed. And we become stuck and can't reach our full potential if we try to go through life alone. I, I know I'm saying it over and over. I get it. I'm being repetitive. We were not designed to do life alone. We were designed for spiritual community. So, you know, even more so than this, it's amazing how God uses people to direct, to direct people's lives. So you think about it, what brought me to Cincinnati? I grew up in the great state of Washington State, the, the great Pacific Northwest, and I never had any kind of intention of ever leaving, but you know, God has a way of doing things. And if I had to come up with one reason, uh, well, it'd be God, but if I had to come up with a reason how God used me, how in the world did this Seattle boy end up in, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio? Well, I'll tell you, it was this beautiful girl at Central Bible College who I fell in love with, and it took me three years to convince her to go on a date with me and when she finally said yes, she realized how amazing her life was going to be. <laughs> it was through my beautiful wife, Liz, because I was introduced to Tri-County Assembly of God through my wife's parents, Don and Terry Triplett, who, who, who were really sent out from this church, commissioned from this church. And I want you to see the beauty of God's plan where he, in his sovereignty, brings people together because he wants us to live life together on mission together. It's an incredible thing, but, but it's way more than just coming and breathing the same air as other people. It's about moving even closer together in small groups, in community, where we're truly living life together. And there's incredible value in that. That's the place where we know others. We are known by others, and we're living on mission together. Man, are you a part of a small group? Are you a part of a small group? And if you're not, can, can you give me a really good reason why you shouldn't be a part of one? Are you a, a, are you a part of a small group? Now, you've got to answer that question yourself, but I'm just going to say this again. We need each other. Join a small group. As Paul committed to live on mission with others, he got even better over time. He also got better with time and his commitment to preach the gospel. It made him a stronger Christian. His community built him up. It grew him in his faith. You need spiritual community, and I'm gonna just be real with you. I know we live in America, and this is how we do church. We come together on a Sunday, we sing some songs, and the preacher gets up and preaches. Church is so much more than that. 
Church is a family. We were designed to do life together. You are not gonna experience community just coming on Sunday. Take it from me, when I moved to Central Bible College, it was my, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I did not wanna get involved in the church for four years when I was at CBC. All I wanted to do was just coast. And so I knew exactly what church I was gonna go to. It was a mega church where I could easily go in, sit in the back, and nobody would even know me. And I did for two years until I was starved for spiritual community because you just can't make it. Now, you can be a part of community in a mega church. I just chose not to. I didn't join small groups, didn't, didn't attend Sunday school. I just came on a Sunday morning, did what I had to, walked out, and nobody knew me. I attended for two years. I don't think I made one friend at that church in two years. It's easy to go to church and not be a part of a spiritual community. All right? Now listen, as a believer, and if you write notes, take this down. If you, if, as a believer, you invest your life into others, not yourself. Okay? As a believer, you invest your life into others, not yourself. So that's the first thing. You need spiritual community. Paul needed it. God provided it for Paul. The, the second thing here, let's look at uh, verse six through 11, is you need to trust in God's plan, not your own. This is the tough one. You need to trust in God's plan, not your own, okay? And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. All right, so the the attack is on again, (laughs) but so is the Spirit's power in Paul's preaching. He faced opposition. This, this, again, a recurring theme over and over in the book of Acts. Paul shook his garments against them in the Jewish gesture of detachment. And he said, if you will not receive this message, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Now, that applied only in Corinth because the next place he went, he started in the synagogue again. But here's the irony of this. He doesn't go very far. I kind of think it's funny because he went right next door. In fact, from the Greek text, it's really clear that the house of this man and the the synagogue actually shared a common wall. (laughs) That had its effects because the first thing we read about after his move is that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, was one to Jesus. He believed in the Lord together with all of his household. So Paul still had access to the synagogue. Not only that, but many Corinthians gave their life to Jesus, right? Praise God. He's finally seeing some results. But what causes Paul some big problems is that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, gets saved. And that's, that's a big win, but it's a big problem too. And, and here's what I want to tell you. Whenever, whenever God is blessing a ministry, you can expect opposition, I'm gonna say it again. Whenever God's blessing a ministry, you can expect opposition. In fact, look at it, 1 Corinthians. You're gonna get a a picture of how Paul viewed this. He says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for the effective work has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So Paul, when he went to Ephesus, that's where he goes next after Corinth, He sees that God is opening up this incredible door for him, but with an incredible open door comes great opposition, and Paul recognizes that. Whenever we experience a blessing in ministry, we can expect some opposition. The enemy is not going to like it when captives are being set free. And so just like in Thessalonica and Berea, the Jews get upset, they stir up trouble, and I want you to know something, that when you encounter opposition, Many times it's only proof that God's up to something. Did you hear me? Opposition usually means that God is up to something and I hope that encourages you today. It's like Charles Spurgeon said, the devil never kicks a dead horse. The devil never kicks a good horse. Well, praise God, it means I'm not a dead horse. Come on, somebody, right? How many of you can say that today? Good, because I ain't a dead horse. (laughs) Devil never kicks a dead horse. So Paul's preaching does what good preaching often does. It brings great response and great opposition. How about that? More anger, more opposition. It seems to be the response any time Paul preaches, but but this time around, the anger and the opposition are against Paul, but, but also against Christ. 
And Paul understands that this is not just an attack on him, but an attack on Jesus as well. And we have talked about this over and over and over again. We as believers need to understand who our enemy is. Okay, and I know it's difficult sometimes when, when the devil is using certain people to attack you or bring hardship to you. It's, it's difficult to understand they're not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And you've got to recognize who the enemy is. And, and Paul recognizes this right away. This is a full-on attack of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. That's what this is. In fact, remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 15 because Paul gets this. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So verse six in our text today shows us how Paul responds. He, he doesn't try to defend himself. He doesn't try to defend his argument. Paul gets it. He, he knows the offensive nature of the gospel when it comes to those who have hard hearts. He gets it. So what do we do when we face opposition? Our natural tendency is to begin to doubt a lot of times, right? Did God really call me to this? I should stop. I, I think maybe, maybe Paul felt this way, and here's why. Because look at, look at with me real quick. We're going to look at verse 9 through 11. But I want you to see how human Paul is here. Okay, this is the guy that had the Damascus Road experience. This is the guy who was blinded by the almighty Jesus on the road. He saw Jesus. He was blinded by the glory of Jesus. He, he gets this supernatural call. He, he knows who's called him. And here he is, depressed, discouraged. And just like anybody else, he starts to doubt. He starts to doubt his own call. He starts to doubt what what because of really what's happening in his life. Maybe God isn't in this. Maybe God's not behind this. And, and I want you to see this. I want you to see what God does in verse nine through 11. It says, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid. Huh. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. What the Lord literally said when he appeared to Paul in this vision was, stop being afraid and keep on speaking. Stop being afraid and keep on speaking. You know what this means? It means that Paul was afraid means Paul was discouraged. We've been talking about it all day. And again, who in the world would blame him? Paul had been down this road. It's all too familiar for him. Been there, done that. He knew what was coming next. He's experiencing a little PTSD here, right? Is that what it's called? <laughs> I've been down this road. I know what comes next. I know the beating that's coming. Man, we just got the ruler of the synagogue saved. I know what that means for me. Hard for some of us to think that, that God has to tell Paul, don't be afraid and keep on speaking. I want you to understand something. All of our heroes have feet of clay. Paul's human like you and he's human like me. Everybody, everybody gets discouraged. My, my hero, one of the greatest preachers of all time, the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon, stunned his congregation congregation, he preached in front of 6,000 people at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, and this is what he said, I'm subject to such fits of depression and discouragement that I would never want anyone to go these depths. Guess what? God's messengers aren't always sailing on cloud nine. They're as human as anyone else, and they face times of discouragement. And I couldn't help it when I got to this part. I couldn't help but stop and thank God for so many people at New Heights Church. And so I'm, I'm taking a moment. I'm gonna get on a soapbox here. I wanna just stop and I wanna thank all of you at New Heights Church who pray for me regularly. I wanna thank you guys from the bottom of my heart, those that have reached out to me, those that have showed up at my door, those that have walked with me through difficult seasons, those who are interceding for me all the time. I am so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like Paul. I can stop and I, I can say, man, I, I can thank God that I have a spiritual community and people in my life, like the apostle did, who pray for me on a regular basis. And so I want to thank you. Thank you. 
New Heights Church. What I love about this passage is Paul gives two promises, okay? Promise for presence and a promise for protection. He says, I am with you. That's his presence. Nobody will harm you. That's his security. So in the gospel, you have the same promise God gave to Paul. You have his presence. In fact, Jesus promised in Matthew 28 to be with you always. God's Holy Spirit is given to every believer, and Jesus says he will be with you and he will be in you. You not only have his presence, you have his security. Look with me at Ephesians real quick. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And then Paul wrote this in Romans. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I, I can't help but think that Paul remembers that moment in Corinth where God spoke to him as he wrote this. I can't help it. He's passing, he's passing on to them what God gave him. The security, listen, that you need is in Jesus. But the problem is, some of you are running. The security that you need is in his presence, but the problem is some of you are running from his presence. You want the protection, but you don't understand his presence. We think we're gonna find security in that next job promotion or in our salary or a retirement plan. The only place, the only place that we will ever find real rest in his, is in his salvation. It's the only place. He separated himself from the Father so you could never be separated from him again. That's what God is reminding of Paul here, and it's what you need to hear today. God wasn't promising Paul that he would never be attacked again, because goodness sakes alive. Just read the rest of Acts. Paul gets beat up again, gets whooped, horrible things happen. He lives a life that I hope I don't live. So that's not what God's promising him here. But what God is telling him here is that no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, Paul, it can't affect you and me. That's the kind of assurance that deals with fear in our life. Do you have that assurance? If not, why not? Now, I want to state the obvious here. Obviously, we've got times of fear. But God has this solution to Paul's fear. He also has a solution to our fear. He's talked about protection, and he's talked about presence. But I want, to, I want you to see how they're connected to your actions, okay? Paul was risking enough in his life that he needed God's help. So my question for you today is, are you risking enough that you need God's help? Are you risking enough that you need God's help? His promises are connected to something. Look with me, Matthew 28 again. Look with me, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How about in Romans? Here we go, I want you to see something. For I am sure that neither death, we talked about this one, but it's my favorite, so I'm gonna repeat it. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Man, there is nothing that he left out there. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very clear, we have his presence and his protection. God never gives us his presence and protection without calling us to action. In other words, we are being called to do something that's going to require his presence and his protection. That's why Paul said here, look, do not, this is why God said to Paul, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and a half after this. For Paul, go on speaking. The word for, this is the reason why I'm with you and no one's gonna harm you in Corinth because I have many in this city who are my people. God had a plan for Paul. God's provision for Paul was for his plan for Paul. So here's my question. Is your commitment to the gospel causing you to take risks? 
Some of you say, well, I live in America. What kind of risk do I have to take? Think about the risks that God is asking us to take. Think about what one of our core values is we stop at nothing to reach all people. This is who we are. This is in our DNA. We stop at nothing. That means fear doesn't stop us. That means uh, we put our security not in our finances, but we put our security in the fact that Jesus Christ told us to go and he's gonna come back. That's what we put our security in. So again, I'm asking, are you risking enough that you need God's help? Are you risking enough in your life, with your finances, with your time? Are you risking enough that you actually need God's help? Paul was putting himself out there, are you? I'm not saying you gotta become a martyr, but I'm telling you that God always calls his people to circumstances that require them to trust him. What are you doing in your life right now that if God doesn't show up, it won't get done? Are you risking enough for God to help you? Because those who have been redeemed by Jesus, they're never done trusting him for what's next, never. When you're living on mission, you're gonna experience his presence and his security. You're gonna experience his presence and his protection when you are on mission. But here's the deal. When God opens doors, Satan does his best to close them. But, but I want you to see this. If Paul had given in to fear here, a door would have been closed. Because there's times when we close the doors on ourselves because of discouragement. We often quit too soon. Don't give in to your fears. Pursue his presence and pursue his protection. But to, in order to do that, you've got to be risking enough to need it. Okay? The fulfillment for Paul was that he stayed there for a year and a half. He stayed. He taught. Hear me, church. To walk by faith is to see the potential. I love what Pastor Jax Hibbs says about this. He says, a pessimist sees only the problems. An optimist sees only the potential, but a realist sees the potential in the problems. <laughs> Is that not powerful? And I don't have time to get into this today. I wish I did. For all of you who follow our notes, you were really hoping for a theological doozy because we were gonna get into the doctrine of the elect. But but we are running out of time, and so I promise I will get into this. And I'll, I'll just briefly state this, though. And it's going to be hard to understand, but what, Paul, Paul, or what God says to Paul when he says, I have many in this city, supports what we know to be the doctrine of election. All right, this is, it's mind-blowing theological truth that, that we can't comprehend or fathom or even understand. But God, by his sovereign grace, chooses who will be saved. And some of you are thinking, are you trying to tell me that God chooses some to go to heaven and some to go to hell? Well, I didn't say that, but, but I did say that God saves us by his grace and that he sovereignly chooses before the foundations of the world who it is going to be saved. Are you confused yet? <laughs> this, this will be a good uh, intro to our uh, small group that we're doing in the summer. You got questions in the sermon. This is what you need to do. Sign up for our small group. We've got about uh, six, four professors that are going to, or profess, well, they are professors in their own right. Four teachers who are going to be teaching and answering difficult questions on the text. But, but yes, I, I hope you're confused, and it's going to be a cliffhanger because we'll talk about it next week. But I don't believe there are people chosen to go to hell. There are people chosen to go to heaven. The Bible is a whoever gospel. Whoever believes, whoever repents, whoever trusts in Jesus Christ can be saved. Whoever wants to believe can believe. And you say, well, I don't, I don't get how that works. How can it be that God sovereignly chooses or elects some people and you can reject it if you want? I don't know. But I believe that both are taught in scriptures. I believe that they reconcile in a higher unity that God knows and God understands. Here's the truth. Whenever the supernatural intersects with the natural, we've got problems with it. And one of the areas, with the greatest problems with this is divine choice, right? Intersects with human choice. Even though the Bible says both are true, that God elects and yet we're told to make a choice, that God predestines people for salvation yet are called to make a decision, seems to be impossible to really understand or grasp. And if your head is hurting right now, that's okay. I want you to get, understand this. Not all things are good for us to know, and so God has not revealed them to us. He's not. And there are some things that are good for us to know even when we can't explain them fully. 
And I, I've, I've referred to this passage so many times when, when Moses says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There are things God does not intend for us to know. They wouldn't be good for us to know. An example of that is in Acts 1, 7. says, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Knowing too much of the future wouldn't be good for us. And here's where I'm gonna close. Wasn't planning on closing with this, but I will. I think this will work good. When we trust God, when Paul, Paul had to trust God, he goes to Corinth, he's facing these difficult times. He's encouraged by God's presence and his protection, and he's also encouraged because he's reminded that he was called. He, remind, he was reminded it was when he was called, God's will for our lives. And We just talked about how there's things in the Bible that are clearly hard to understand, and yet we have to just trust God. Here's, here's what I want to close with today. I know, I know for me, there have been times in my life where if God could have told me what was, what was next or what was a part of or maybe the price tag to whatever he was calling me to do, I may have said no if I had known too much, right? You know, when God called me to go to India, if I had known that in six months we were gonna be run out of the country, I may not have chosen that for my, for my family and my life. But, and, and for the longest time, I couldn't understand what God was doing. I couldn't understand that for six years God had called me to India only to close that door. That Liz and I had given up everything in the States, our entire life, to go serve as missionaries in the country of India for six months later for us to be booted out of the country. Rerouted to the country of Thailand and didn't even know what to do in Thailand. Ended up doing what all the other missionaries didn't want to do and even did what they considered not missions, so we were kind of the outcasts. We were going to pastor an international church never realizing that through that international church that I would be connected to Pastor Brad Rosenberg. Even I was connected through the triplets, but it was really that being rerouted. One of Pastor Brad's greatest strengths was his compassion. When he had heard what had happened to uh, the guy that was married to Don and Terry's youngest daughter, he came through Thailand and he, he wanted to connect with us because again, his heart was compassion. He knew they were hurting missionaries and he connected to us. And I would not have connected to him like I did if God had not redirected me from India to Thailand. It was through that connection that I ended up here today. I can't, can't tell you though, if I could go back and I would have known the pain of the process of loving a country so much and giving six years of your life to it only to arrive for six months and be rerouted the pain that I suffered and experienced in that time, I may not have done it if I had known. But now I can look back and I'm glad. I've shared the story of my dad before many times as well. Very smart person who taught at Northwest University, was a pastor, a district leader. Only he gets called to leave all of that and go into missions only to not make it to the mission field because he's diagnosed with a brain tumor battles the brain tumor for nine years. The one thing he loses was his ability to speak. That was his gift. I've often said this, there were people in our life that we knew that we had always prayed for and, and I remember, I've told you, I grew up listening to my dad pray in the den next to my room. He would wake up 4 a.m. every morning and I could, I could probably repeat, repeat his prayers today. <laughs> as an adult, because I remember it so well, where he would pray for people in his life that he loved dearly that needed to know Jesus. And again, I think when I get to heaven, I'm gonna know more, but I do believe today, I never would have thought it, when I attended my father's funeral after he battled uh, this tumor for nine years and he had all kinds of platforms. But at his funeral, the most the, the most testimonies were coming from people who knew him when he didn't speak. Testimonies coming from people who did not know my dad when he could preach and teach because they watched somebody trust God through a very difficult circumstance and situation. And I know because I've heard my dad's prayers. He wanted his life to be used for the kingdom. I know, I know that he would have been happy and glad to know that his pain and his suffering helped so many people find peace in Jesus in their own pain and suffering. We can't look back and at our lives and 
it's hard to look back and regret regret anything unless we've made bad choices but it's really hard to look back and regret anything when you're following God when you said yes no matter how hard the path is no matter how hard the road is it really comes down to trust what has God called us to do trusting in God's plan and not ours and sometimes it means stepping back and saying God this this isn't how I saw this going but I still trust you. I didn't see it happening like this, but I still trust you. I know you called, called me to this, or this season of my life. Maybe it's a job promotion. Maybe you really thought God was behind something. You moved your family. You thought you heard from God. Now you're experiencing these things you don't understand. I want you to just trust in God's plan, not yours. He has a plan. He's leading you. He's guiding you. And he's promised his protection and his presence. So I want to close today. I've gone a little over. I want to close today. When I'm done praying, you're officially dismissed. But if you've got some time, I want to challenge you and encourage you. Remember, God promised protection and presence. There's something that happens when we get in the presence of God. Our fears seem to just crumble when we've been in the presence of God. I don't know about you, but I want, I want to experience that presence. Okay? Father, we love you so much. Oh, we love your word. It has the power to change our life. And God, I'm overwhelmed today on this stage as I preach to so many people who I know are going through difficult seasons. They're experiencing hurt and pain and there's probably doubt and discouragement and they're needing, just like Paul needed, to be encouraged by the almighty living God. So today those two things you promised Paul you've promised us for your protection and your presence and so God today I pray we would be encouraged to know that we are exactly where you want us doing exactly what you want us to do and we would hold on to your promises that you will never leave us or forsake us and you will protect us there is absolutely nothing the enemy can do It doesn't matter what he does to come against us, who he uses to come against us, circumstances he'll use to come against us. He cannot rob us of our salvation. He cannot get in the way of us and you. What your son did on the cross is final. We have experienced salvation. He cannot touch us. Today, that we would be encouraged in that. God, lift our spirits. Those who need their spirits lifted, lift our spirits today. Let us soak in your presence and be ministered to, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in here to do what only you can do. Be the counselor, be the comforter. Move in our lives, move in our circumstances, move in our situations. Encourage your servants today to get up and not quit to keep walking to keep pushing forward so that you can get the glory and i pray this in the mighty name of jesus and everybody says amen